So welcome. Um, my name is Budge Courier. I'm with the 911 branch with Cal OES. And we hope you're all here to talk about Next Gen 911 because that's what a primor primarily we're going to talk about today. So the agenda is on the screen as I talk through some of these agenda items. If you want a copy of the presentation, send an email to Andrew. His email is up on the screen and he'll send it to you right now. We don't have this posted on our website yet. This is version 13 of the slides, lucky number 13, hopefully, maybe the last version. Um, and in order for us to post it on the website for the state, it has to stabilize and we have to run it through ADA compliance, which takes some time. So to get around that, if you need a copy of the, of the presentation, send us off an email and we'll get it to you while you're sitting right here. So we're gonna be talking about NextGen 901. I'll walk you through our RFP process that we used to select our vendors, give you an overview of what we're doing in California, talk a lot about how this will impact your PSAP uh, in hopefully all good ways, but some of the ways you're gonna wanna ask some questions. I want this to be interactive. Um, it will take us till three o'clock to get through this. We have a break built in, so if you're thinking we were kidding, uh, we weren't. It'll, it's about lo how long it's been taking. And if you have a question at any time, just interrupt, raise your hand. What we're doing today is we're going to tape this session, which is why you see the cameras and the microphone, uh, and make it available on a, as a YouTube video so that anybody who couldn't be here, or if it's, you wanna remember what was said, you'll be able to go back and watch it. So in a couple weeks, we'll finish our editing and get this posted up on the website. So as I go through the presentation, I'll introduce different people from the Cal OES team that are here. There are many in the room, and I'll let you know the role they play in the project. All right, so before we get going, any questions? All right, so we may, Andrew, we may wanna think about some more chairs. Yeah, looks like we're getting pretty full. I only see about five or six open. All right. So I wanna start with this graphic. Um, I've used this many times. Uh, focuses on how the, all these technologies are connected in your PSAP. And, and we'll talk briefly about what, you, what each one of these is as we go through the presentation. So NextGen 911 obviously is what we've all been talking about for about 10 years or more. Believe it or not, it's here and it's coming and it's coming probably faster than you thought it would. So we're gonna go through those timelines today. The other piece of the equation is land mobile radio. So while we can't fund land mobile radio out of 911 funds, right? That's an FCC rule, we can't do it. We do help coordinate some of your land mobile radio activities. So we have some guidance documents. I have a whole part of my team that help coordinate this type of uh, um, your land mobile radio statewide. So if you have any questions on available grant funding, policies, procedures, and how to integrate it, let us know. We can certainly meet with you. We're gonna talk a lot about alert and warnings today and how we've leveraged the NextGen 911 system as a delivery platform for alert and warnings. And I've got four or five slides dedicated to that. And then we'll talk briefly about broadband services. So that's that piece that's carrying data from your PSAP out to the mobile data terminals, mobile data computers that are out in the field and some of the other applications that are being run across those broadband services. Obviously, FirstNet is a piece of that, and so are some of the other providers, and we'll talk through that. I put this graphic up so that as you're talking to your police chiefs, your sheriffs, fire chiefs, city managers, boards of supervisors, whoever you're inter interacting with at the decision level, they understand the importance of what we're doing and what this is gonna bring for your PSAP. So I've got this list up here on the board. Uh, we're gonna, it's get, definitely gonna help to harden our system so we can survive some of the disasters that we see. Right now you've got camera trunks coming into your PSAP. They're a single point of failure. When any of those go down, you lose your PSAP. How many of you have had an outage in the last month or two, either with your, your 911 network or your Annie Alley? So I see some hands go up. If this system was built if, if the system was hardened the way it should be, no hands should go up, certainly not in the last month. And that's what we're moving toward. We're gonna talk a little bit about how the system will allow you to reroute 911 calls anywhere, literally anywhere in the state. So just for fun, we could send all the calls down to LAPD if we want, 
right? Um, and so we'll talk a lot about that. It's going to reduce our system downtime. You saw the hands that went up in the room of how many have had an anti alley outage or a network outage in the last month or two. It'll allow us to leverage NextGen 911 as a common delivery system for alert and warnings. Again, I'll, I'll talk about that later on. We're going to make sure that the calls are delivered quickly and accurately. We're seeing that in general, in the existing legacy network, it's five to seven seconds in a perfect situation of when a call gets delivered. NextGen 911 is probably closer to three seconds uh, and maybe faster. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk through that. And we'll increase our location accuracy. And I'll talk a little bit about later on in the presentation, our rapid deploy project and, and what we're doing with that project and you'll be able, able to ask some questions. Really this last bullet is really important to think about. Once we deliver a secure IP connection to your PSAP, we can leverage that connection to do all kinds of other things that are important to 911. And it's really helping us to think through what those possibilities are and how we deliver them. So when your leadership comes to you and asks you, you know, why is this important? Why do we need to do this? Feel free to use this list as a starting point and then talk about how it's going to be beneficial to you at the local level. So we're here today because we've made some huge progress on what we're doing for NextGen 911 in California. We announced on August 20th our uh, vendor partners that are going to help us build out this solution. So you see on this map, this is a breakdown of the regions in California. That purple region to the north um, is the northern region. Uh, the, the section in the center in yellow is the central region. LA is its own region just by call volume and number of PSAPs. And then down in the south is that region in the green. In order to make sure that this network doesn't go down and has the reliability we need, we, work, we um, selected a prime vendor. The name of that company is Autos. They will be connected to every single PSAP in California. All right, so that way if one of the regions has an issue, uh, then it will be able to route those calls to the prime and the prime could deliver that call. They also serve as, as a way to make sure that the system is standardized so that everybody is delivering based on the same set of standards. So we've got a representative from Autos here, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Phil Rotherham from Autos. I'm our uh, global head of product strategy. And as of two days ago, officially self-appointed coffee bringer for these sessions. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. And the home-baked uh, cookies were made by me. In case you don't like them, they're actually my wife's. <laughs> I am local to, to the area. Uh, I've lived in either uh, Roseville or Folsom for the last 21 years and actually been active in public safety for the last 27 years, almost. Um, excited about this project, working with the state, with the, uh, the regional uh, network service providers that are here today as well. So thanks, bud. All right. And then our project manager on the state side is Ann, if you want to stand up and introduce everybody. So our single point of contact for everything related to the prime is Ann. So if you have any questions, go through um, her with regard to that, uh, with regard to the prime. Now, where we are today is in the northern region. Um, and so the, the company that was selected to deliver services there is Synergym. So Danny, I know you're here if you want to introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danny McGinnis. I'm the director of project management for Synergym. I'll be the uh, executive uh, lead for Synergym on the northern region. Been in 911 for about 20 some years, uh, mostly uh, deploying NG911. Like NG911 around the country. All right. And then our project manager on the state side is Angela, if you want to stand up and introduce yourself. So she'll be your point of contact in everything related to Synergym uh, and how that deployment's moving forward. We know there may be some from the central region here. So the central region we awarded to NGA911. If you guys want to introduce your team, I don't know, Donna, if, Don, if you want to do that, or Daryl. Hi, Daryl Whipper, Senior Vice President of Strategic Relationships for Entrada, and I am the Executive uh, Liaison to Cal OES for this project. Yay. All right, and with us is Don Ferguson, who is our CEO, and Michelle Bland, who I'm sure many of you know, is our Senior Vice President of, uh, of Operation. So the project <coughs> manager that you have, uh, that uh, anybody from Central will have, reports to Michelle. 
All right, so moving down through the state, the LA region was also awarded to NGA 911, the same team, um, a different project manager from their team. And then on the state side, Sharice is our project manager. I don't know, I haven't seen her in the room. She's not here today. Um, we had to leave somebody back in the office. Um, so Sharice is the project manager for that region. And then down in the south, we selected CenturyLink. And CenturyLink, I, they don't have any representative here today, but they will at subsequent meetings. And Kurt Galat is the project manager for the state side. And I know he's here somewhere, standing up in the back there. So these are the partners that uh, we've selected to deliver these services. And I want to talk through a little bit about how we arrived there, just so that you understand um, how we selected these vendors through the state process. So we used the competitive bid process. How many of you are, have participated in, in procurements and RFPs? What a fun, lovely process, right? We're all, yeah. So we, we went through a process. I'm going to walk you through some of the steps at a high level just so you understand how, they were, how these bidders were chosen. A total of eight bidders started in, in the process, and in the end, we ended up awarding to the four that you saw. We established um, there, was a require, there is a requirement in California that 911 services have to be tariffed. So what that means is that each of these uh, vendors that we selected, they have to file with the California Public Utilities Commission a tariff that defines their service and the price for that service. So once that's done, and for three of the four companies it's done, matter of fact, all of the companies in the room have finished that process, uh, what we were able to do in the contract is we've defined the service, and if we, if we figure out that we need 12 of something instead of 10, we don't need to do a change order and go back and modify the contract and everything. We simply reach out the tariff and get two more of that service that's already defined at that price. So that gives us a lot of flexibility in how we deliver the service. And then obviously we have the regulatory oversight of the PUC on our side to make sure that they're willing and able uh, to deliver the service that's defined there. So it took a lot of coordination, but once we get it in place, it's really going to save a lot of time in the project. We also established not to exceed pricing. Sometimes in procurements, you have to throw out, throw out the high bidder or the low bidder, and we don't want to do that because you could inadvertently throw out a bidder that either misunderstood something or has a good delivery and just, just miss the price. So we did a lot of market research to figure out what next gen 911 services should cost and everyone had to comply with those not to exceed costs. We listed a bunch of functional requirements. There were about a hundred or so of them and they simply had to answer, each vendor had to answer yes or no. If they answered no, then during we would talk to them and if they couldn't get to yes, then they were gone. And then we took those things that were important to California there were about 30 of them, and we, may, we asked each, one, each vendor to, to uh, write a narrative description on how they would meet that requirement. So we picked those things that were unique to California that we wanted to make sure that they could deliver on. They wrote a narrative, and we evaluated those scores. The top scores are the ones that we ended up selecting. And we also made, uh, took another step. If there were those who asked for changes to our contract or they couldn't agree to our standard um, our SLAs that were in the contract, or they wanted to modify the statement of work, those bidders didn't make it through the process either. So that's how we got to where we are. All four regions have a qualified bidder. Don't think you got last place. Everyone is qualified, able to deliver the services in California. So any questions on that before I go on? All right. So I put this slide up here so you can see our timeline. We started last February um, in, in this process. When we released the original RFP to when we awarded, not one date changed. We didn't miss anything, which is quite a miracle in and of itself. Matter of fact, a couple of them we even were ahead of. Like it says up there, all contracts signed by August 30th. Autos' contract was signed on August 20th, the day we announced. And, most, and the other two uh, vendors that are in the room were signed a couple days later. So that's not just signed by them, that's signed by the state as well. Like completely executed contract within two to four days of when we made announcements. So we're moving pretty fast through this process. And you see our goal was to have tariffs filed by the end of November. Three of four have already finished their tariff filings as well. And, and the, the fourth one is, is well on their way to getting that done. 
So we've got a pretty aggressive timeline. We're, we're, we've met all of these dates and we're pushing forward. We wanna make sure you understand what these bidders are doing for the state of California. All right, so I put this graphic up here. I'm not gonna talk through each of these points, but we're making sure that the service delivered matches your need, which is why we're here today. We wanna tell you kind of where we are today so you can give us feedback on things that we may have either overlooked or haven't emphasized or haven't outlined. So that's, this is really the first step of that conversation. This slide, you can't read. I know that. <laughs> I can't read it. I'm standing right here. But the reason why it's in the deck is so that when you ask for it, you've got the name, email, and phone number of everybody in every region and on the state side, the project manager, so that you have the ability to reach out and contact these folks directly. All right, so ask us for a copy of the presentation. We'll keep this current on our website, and if it changes, we'll immediately let you know if something's changed. We don't anticipate any changes, but we'll make sure that this information is available. We're gonna spend a few minutes on this graphic, and this is where I hope you start asking questions, because this is really what NextGen 911 is all about. So, this graphic here shows what the network is going to look like and how it's going to be used to deliver 911 calls to your PSAP. So I'm going to talk through this at kind of a high level. Over there on the left hand side um, where it says legacy and wireless OSP, those are your originating service providers. So that's your AT&T wireline, Frontier, Consolidated Communications, all the small LECs that are in the state all the voice over IP providers, and all the wireless providers, AT&T Mobility, Verizon Wireless, T-Mobile, Sprint, and anyone else that's out there. So once you make a 911 call from any one of those vendors or any one of those originating service providers, it's gonna come into what we call a point of interface or a POI, P-O-I. If that call is already an IP packet, it's already in SIP format, then we'll just route it on. If it's not, it'll be converted. What that does is it helps us with some of the rules that are in place with the California Public Utilities Commission statewide. So we'll convert that into an IP packet, and then it goes down to one of these two aggregation centers. I have a pointer, but once you put it on the screen, it doesn't work. So, um, so those aggregation centers, what they're there for is to make sure that if the region is, is active and able to deliver a call, then it, then it goes to the region. If the region's not available and active and able to deliver a call, then it would deliver it to the prime and the prime would do that. That's how we back ourselves up. So this entire network that you see here on the right is duplicated down here in each one of these region ESI nets that you see. So you'll have to imagine in your mind, you can imagine that the chart would get ridiculously complicated if we put that all that in there. But all that infrastructure you see there is duplicated and managed separately and independently for each of the regions. So as we move through the network, you see this thing that's called 911 access kind of in the center there. That's a segmented IP network that's intended to connect all the regions together. The data centers that are in each region, the data centers that are managed by the prime, by Autos, as they're processing calls, all right? The next network segmentation is the PSAP uh, MPLS, or the PSAP network layer, which runs from those data centers that you see over to the PSAPs. The primary purpose of that network is to make sure we can bring a call to your PSAP from any data center that's used to support this solution. And you'll notice there's two lines going into the PSAP there. There's like two um, lines that run up into your PSAP. We've already begun to work with the providers we selected, and they've given us a list of IP or wholesale IP providers. We want two logically and physically diverse paths into each PSAP from each vendor. So that means Autos will be bringing two connections into your PSAP and your region provider. So if you're in, most of you are probably in the north, uh, Synergym will be bringing those two connections into your PSAP. That way we get a system that has the reliability we need in order to support 911. And just to make sure that it's reliable, it's because this IP connection is gonna be extremely important, we're building out over on the far side, you see a little bubble there called CAPSnet. That's a statewide 
microwave network that's on 300 plus sites that we will extend into the PSAPs throughout the state. So if you have, the only exception with that is if you have a, st a county or city owned microwave or fiber network that you want us to interface with, we'll interface with that network. The idea is we want to do a connection into your PSAP that's completely independent of the commercial providers. Right, that way if there's something that happens on the commercial side, we still have another path into your PSAP. So for CHP and CAL FIRE, I know you're both in the room. Almost every, every CHP site and almost every CAL FIRE site, there's already an existing microwave link. We'll be looking to convert that over to a digital path and bring, um, with the ability to bring 911 calls across that link. So if you have a microwave network in your county or city, let us know. If you don't, then we'll be coming to talk to you about, okay, is there room for us to put a dish on your tower? Is there room in your back room for us to put the equipment, to put a microwave link in your PSAP, to add another level of, of redundancy into the system? And then we went one step farther, and you see there, you see a little bubble in it that says LTE. That LTE will be a cradle point router with dual SIMs in it, and we will pick the carrier that has the best throughput to support your PSAP. So it could be an AT&T connection using FirstNet, could be Verizon, it could be T-Mobile. We'll come on site and do a test and figure out which one of those is the best and we'll put that in. All of these are managed by our vendors with the oversight of Cal OES. None of this touches your IT infrastructure at your PSAP, nothing. We're gonna be completely independent. We'll talk about that a little bit. All right. And then you'll see a couple other pieces up there. Text to 911 is a cloud-based service that's integrated with this, as well as alert and warning, and we're gonna talk about those quite a bit. All right, questions. Somebody has to have a question, I'm sure. Yes? For the microwave, microwave network, is it required that we use our own, or could we do either or? So question was, if you've got a microwave um, connection into your PSAP, is it required that we use it? No, we could do either or. Talk to us and we'll figure out what makes the most sense. If we couldn't find space on your tower, space in your back room, or a frequency to bring that to you, then we might talk to you a little bit more about using something you have. But we've built, we've included that as part of our plan to extend our microwave network all the way to your PSAP. Yes. So ideally, we, for example, I got a call yesterday from a lady in my county calling 911 that she needed an emergency and passed the unit. So I would be able to ask Yes, so it's even easier than that. So if a call comes into your PSAP, the question was if a call came in to, where you, what PSAP are you? Calaveras, Calaveras County. County for? And they needed Pasadena. And they want to be transferred to Pasadena, so way down in, in the um, south, or I guess, I think it's, yeah, the south. So um, what would happen is you would just simply transfer that call, and then the system would know, okay, that's not connected to me as a region. It would route that call to Prime, to Atos, and Atos would deliver that call to Pasadena. Absolutely, it's exactly the way it works. See, yep, that's exactly how it's gonna work. Yeah, all right, yes, in the back. Um, as far as with the microwaves, uh, where I'm at, we're right on a scenic highway, and so we have a lot of restrictions on what can be installed where. It's, is there going to be allowances for this type of situation to kind of bypass that uh, or work with that or anything along those lines? Okay, so the question is, if you're in a location where there's some, some pretty severe restrictions on what can be mounted to a tower, can, can we bypass that? No, but we will, we work in those conditions as well and we can apply for the permits and see if we can get it approved and put in. Uh, if we can do it, we will, because obviously it's adding another layer of resiliency to the network, which is what we ultimately want. So we'll work with you and see what's possible, right? Maybe if we try and bring a much smaller dish into your location. Usually those are approved a little bit easier. Uh, we've even done things where we've put in a, an RF transparent, you know, interface. It looks like, maybe it, maybe it looks like a, an old wooden water tower or something, and then the dishes behind that. We've done that in a few places too. So we'll see what's possible. Each one of these is gonna be kind of unique. All right, other questions? Yes. I was 
No, we're not, we are not, there's no need for selective routers in this scenario. None. No, we're not connecting. Right. So the question is, um, when we're wh let's say that a region comes on first, right? Um, pick one. Say the north comes online first. Danny and Synergym are just out in front of everybody, and they're fully deployed. Um, and then they need to transfer to a PSAP that that is not on NextGen 911 yet, meaning they're connected to a legacy selective router. In that case, we we may may, and we haven't built this into our plan have a connection into a legacy selective router. The far better way to do this would be to say, Atos, you're the prime, you're connected to every PSAP. You've, you've been selected because you're the leader and you're gonna go first. So any transfer then, if Atos can be up, running, and connected to every PSAP, we don't need a legacy selective router transfer. That's how we wanna make this transition. Otherwise, the network paths get very complicated for interconnecting with those legacy selective routers. We have 45 of them. I think it's 45, is that the number in the back? How many legacy selective routers are there? 45. Uh, and you can imagine the spaghetti point-to-point -point connection that would be needed to support that, which is why we're not doing it that way. So we're encouraging Atos to go fast and correct, um, and that's how we, we would accommodate that. Far better way to do it. We're encouraging, so the question was, will every PSAP be on the prime before we go live? With a region. With a region. That's the goal, right? Now, some of the regions are going to beg to differ because they're going to be going just as fast as the prime. But that's the goal, right? Because then that solves a lot of these problems. The other thing to keep in mind is these, both these networks are up at the same time. So the legacy network and the way you're receiving calls today is going to remain in place until this network is up, tested, functioning, and integrated for the very reason that you just said. Otherwise, the point-to-point the -point connections we need to make to do transfers through a legacy selective router get extremely complicated, which we did not want to do. Yeah. So good question. All right, other questions? Okay, so let's start getting into some of the details. Uh, we want to make sure you understand that the region vendors are not subcontractors to the prime. The region vendors are delivering, delivering a fully compliant, fully capable next-gen 911 solution. There are certain data that's shared between them, but in the absence of being able to share that data, the region can still deliver the call the way it's supposed to be delivered. Um, so sometimes you use the term prime and you think, oh, they're the prime contractor and everybody else is a sub. That's not the way that this works. The Prime does have some unique functions. They're gonna be the ones that develop the interface standards that you see up there on the left-hand side to make sure that everybody can work together. They're also gonna be uh, responsible for text to 911 deployment and alert and warning and some of the other system-wide monitoring and um, decisions that need to be made in the network to make sure this works the way that it has to. And there's very, clear and specific requirements for collaboration throughout the process. And they've already begun collaborating, which is great news. And there's some pretty big incentives for them if they don't collaborate. So we want to make that clarity. Where we are right now, we, uh, we had our initialization meetings with all the vendors the 4th through the 11th of September, and on the 11th we had all the vendors in the same room. Had some great dialogue on roles, responsibilities, how this collaboration would happen. Priorities, meeting schedules, and all that has begun to happen. So think about how fast that is, right? We awarded contract on the August 20th. Contracts were signed by the 26th, and less than, what, two weeks later, we're already meeting with the project teams for each of the, uh, of the vendors. So we've been moving pretty quick through this process. 
Our project managers will be your main point of contact, but we know you also are very familiar with your PSAP advisors. So if you want to reach out to your PSAP advisor, um, then please continue to do that. I think we have some of the advisors in the room, uh, but I have the advisor supervisor who will make sure that gets done. So that's Andrew. Andrew is the supervisor over the four PSAP advisors. So hopefully you know who your PSAP advisor is and you've talked to them recently, all right? Um, we're gonna be sending out, obviously we're doing these town halls. We've got six more to go, and five more after today. So at the halfway point today when we take our break, I'll be half done. Um, and then uh, we'll send out an email by the 18th with all the coordinating instructions. The reason why we're waiting a little bit longer to send that out because we've been getting some good questions in these um, meetings and we want to make sure we address those questions in that email. And then after we send that email, that's when we'll start the engagement with the um, PSAP surveys. So you could be expected to be contacted by your region provider, Synergym, and the Prime, somebody from Autos, because they're both going to need to come and, and do a survey in your PSAP. Those surveys should happen in November or December this year. Well, they will happen in November, December this year. This is a look at, a, at our uh, schedule and where we are. So early on, we formed our project teams. We're done with that step. We are gonna schedule site surveys. That's kind of the next big thing coming. We'll finish that up by the end of the year. Um, the, the next thing we're gonna do is begin to order circuits. As a matter of fact, that's already started. What we did is we asked each vendor to give us a list of who they're gonna to use to bring that IP connection to your PSAP. And then we took a look at what the region provider sent us. We'll take a look at what the prime, Autos, is gonna deliver so we can make sure that everybody's not using the same provider, right? Remember, we want logical and physical diversity on those connections. It might be that you're in a really rural area and you know there's only one provider, like only one IP connection can reach your PSAP. In that case, we will still bring two, one that's managed by your region provider and one that's managed by the prime provider. That way we at least get logical separation between those two networks, All right? And then we will start working with other providers to see if we can find another path into that piece, into your PSAP. So obviously these circuits are gonna come across probably companies you're familiar with. We've uh, started a project with Comcast to bring fiber to every PSAP in the state and they're working with Charter and Cox depending on what company you're in or what county you're in and we also know that you know AT&T with their um, telephone network is going to be a big part of this project so we're working with them and other providers that have large networks will probably be involved in this as well all right the SD-WAN that's a software defined wide area network what that does is it enables us to take a look at all these IP connections and see what paths are available. Like how can we reach your PSAP? So that if one IP connection goes down, this SD-WAN controller will know, okay, there's another path to PSAP going this route and it'll route the call that way. Uh, it's not a point-to-point -point network like you're used to today where if you cut one point, you're down. It, it, this network doesn't work that way. Each of them are gonna build their own network operations center and then they'll be, um, we have in the contract the requirement for that system monitoring to be linked together and we'll be able to provide some interface to you at the PSAP of what this next gen 911 network is doing, the health of it, and what it looks like. Each of them are already starting to build their engine core services. So this is the intelligence that's used to route the calls and do everything we need in next gen 911. They're already started to build these. As a matter of fact, NGA 911 has a cloud solution, and I think it's ready to go now, right? I mean, theirs is done, ready. Uh, and others are coming online soon, so that's part of this deployment that's happening. Once we get a connection into your PSAP, it's tested, vetted, validated, and the interface equipment's there, the next thing we have to do is to make sure that we can connect to your CPE. So we're building a lab Matter of fact, the contractors were there yesterday doing their, or was it today? Today, doing their walkthrough. We're gonna put two positions of Viper, two positions of Vesta, and then two more positions in there for testing. We're gonna bring all four vendors in. So the interface from the next gen 911 network to your CPE will be tested and validated in our lab before we even come to your PSAP. 
but we still have to come to your PSAP and do the testing. And that will happen in a, in a perfect world toward the end of 2020 is when we'll start that testing. All right, any questions on that timeline? So I'm gonna talk about some details here in just a second. All right, now what can mess that timeline up? Because it was an optimistic timeline. There's some hurdles we have to get over. We know that, right? The first one is just availability of network connectivity. I, I need to be able to bring an IP connection into your PSAP, more than one, in order for this to really have the reliability we need. So we're gonna work with you to figure out what that is and our vendors are already scrubbing that list. We'll have a pretty good idea within a month or two where the gotchas are for that one. We need available space in your back room. How much space? Well, hopefully before all of you came here, you knew you were coming to a next gen 911 meeting, so you went in your back room and you put a piece of tape on the floor and you X'd it out a nice full rack space, 19 inch rack with a twist lock, 20 amp dedicated circuit and uh, grounding, and you labeled it with Cal OES because you knew, you, you just knew. How many did that? Okay, well, <laughs> that's really what we need, right? We need about an entire rack space for the equipment. Probably is only gonna take about three quarters of a rack, but that's really what we need. And we know that's just not possible in every single PSAP which is the reason why we have to do site surveys and, and come talk to you and make sure we can work through that. Um, so we have to coordinate with you. So when we reach out to you to schedule these meetings and you come back and you say, okay, um, we can't, this week doesn't work, but a couple weeks from now is gonna be fine. Okay, we could probably do that. If you come back to us and say, this isn't gonna work, we'll be, come back in March. Mm, no, 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 we're not waiting until March. So we need to find somewhere between now and the end of the year, we can come into your PSAP with both of these vendors and get these surveys done, right? And so we have to work with you. So if there's something you know, you've already got a planned event, some other install, something else that's gonna impact your PSAP, reach out to our project manager and let us know so we can block out that in our schedule. We'll communicate that back to the vendors and they'll know, okay, we can't go to this PSAP during this two week block, all right? Obviously, your local IT people may be a little bit excited about what's going on here. How many IT people are in the room? All right, we have a few. You're probably like, eh, it's a lot of scary stuff. Well, this we, we promise this, we're not touching your network because we don't trust you. <laughs> yeah. And it's mutual, right? And you don't trust us. But if you think about it from a security posture, that's the way it should be. We're not gonna use anything, any existing IT infrastructure at your facilities, with maybe a couple of exceptions. If you tell us, look, there's this conduit that you can pull fiber through. Okay, those are the kind of conversations we need to have. Or, I've got this segment of dark fiber sitting here, we're not using, you could use it, that kind of stuff. We also wanna be very clear that this equipment doesn't need to physically be in the same room as your CPE. So your call processing equipment could be in another closet or another room or something, as long as there's a path between the two. Uh, it doesn't need to physically be located in the same exact spot. So really, the coordination with IT is just to make sure you know what we're doing, you know where these cable runs are, we have from you how to mark, label them and everything, and then you, you're confident that we're not gonna touch your network and you're not gonna touch our network. Then I think everything is gonna be fine, okay? But there's, a there's, there's going to be some, when you go back, if they're not in the room and you tell them what we're doing, trust me, this is the reaction they're gonna have is when you see all the IT people here. Um, and then the connections to the originating service providers. We have to work with all those and be able to be able to ingress, bring those 911 calls into the network. And that, that's really on us. But if we run into some challenges there, it could certainly impact the timeline. All right, so now we wanna talk about what we're gonna do at your PSAP in the near term. Any questions on this before we go on? Okay, so in the near term, what, how is this gonna affect your PSAP? Well, you can anticipate, like I said, about a rack of equipment. The vendors that come are gonna identify where this equipment would go. Please don't install other equipment in there after we've been there. Um, and it, once we start installs, don't rip it out and throw it away. We've had that happen before too. Hey, what's this stuff? I don't know. This, so we'll coordinate with you. We'll clearly mark it, label it. When the vendors come, they'll label. 
We're doing a form, um, uh, a survey form. It's very lengthy. And we're going to highlight in yellow all the stuff that we need input on from the PSAP. And then it's about eight pages long. There will be other things in there that you don't have to fill out. So just the stuff in yellow. So don't think, oh, it's eight pages. I got No, it's just the stuff in yellow. We're also going to work with Andrew and his team. And anything we know about your PSAP will pre-populate in that form so that, that you don't have to go through all that work. All right. Um, if we haven't visited you in four or five years, then maybe there might be less information that we know for sure, but we'll put what we know in there. The first vendor who shows up will fill the form out. Then they'll take that filled out form and share it with the next vendor so that they don't have to do the same work again and they can just validate it. Um, we would like to schedule Atos as the prime and your region provider on the same day. May not happen. It's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, they're using folks to do their surveys. Very difficult to coordinate those schedules, but we, where we can, we will. But that's how the process will work. So we'll send you that form. It's going to be long. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff on there that we need to know, and we want to be let you know what we're looking at as we plan this project. Um, the goal is a standard rack configuration at each PSAP, like a dedicated rack at each PSAP. It just helps us as we move into the future. May not always be possible. You might tell us you can have this half rack here and this half rack over there. Let us know when we get there and we'll work through those challenges. Um, we know that you may not all have the space. So you might have your equipment mounted in a broom closet and there's just no space at all. We need to know that. We have the ability to go out to a state contract, CMAS, and get a vendor on board and come in and make space for this equipment. We can mount it on a wall. We can, there's a whole bunch of things we can do to get this equipment in your PSAP. But at the end of the day, we need a 20 amp dedicated circuit with a twist lock grounded set of equipment and we'll bring um, UPS for that rack. That's what we need. If you have a grounding system in your back room that you want us to integrate with, let us know when we get there. We could probably do that as well for backup power and grounding and whatever you've got um, you know, at your facility. Okay, so questions on this, because I know somebody has a question about back room. No, we're not gonna build you a new PSAP. So if you're thinking, <laughs> all right, gonna get a new PSAP, no. <laughs> So any questions on that, on how we're going to do the surveys? Concerns, yeah? All we need is a, all, we will provide the rack. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you don't have the twist lock plug or whatever, you know, we can do that too. That's part of what we need to know when we come to the survey. Okay. Yeah, we want to make this clear. This is not an unfunded state mandate. It's just not what this is, right? We're going to do our best to accommodate what needs to be done at every PSAP. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. When should we anticipate the surveys are going to go out to the center managers? So for, for CAL FIRE, we'll coordinate with Bubba because we've learned he's got to be in the loop. Um, but we will, send, we will send the initial email from CAL OES will be before the middle of October. So you'll have all this, and in there we'll put, here's the standard rack configuration requirements and all that. And then following, following from that, you'll get another individual email introducing, here's the vendor um, representative that's going to be on site, here's target dates and all that, and then we'll start that coordination process. That'll come from a project managers and Cal OES initially. So if you're deleting Cal OES emails, not that anybody does that, you're going to probably want to remember these names up here because when they come in from them, you might want to read the, uh, those because they're going to have some important information in them. But it'll come from that project manager at Cal OES. Okay? That's a good question. Yes? You mentioned a dedicated UPS. Is that additional space in addition to the... All in the same rack. Everything we need, power distribution, everything will all be in one rack. Yeah. Unless you split us among different racks, then we're going to have to talk and see what that looks like. Okay, that, that becomes a little harder. Bubba. As a, as a point of clarification, we're talking about more if you have house UPS and have a 20 amp isolated 
push slot or 524 the rack, the new rack, then there's no need for the rack kind of UPS to sort of your prime and regional. Right. So the question is about um, if you have house UPS that exists. Yes, we can integrate with that if you want us to. Right? Just let us know. Again, that's part of the survey, part of what we're going to be looking at. All right. The other piece of the survey that's pretty important is where those IP connections terminate in your building might not be in the same room. Right? So wherever your MPO or your DMARC point is, where you bring in circuits from the outside, we need to know where that is. Because in a perfect world, we're bringing in four of those, right? If we can find four logically and physically diverse connections, then we'll bring in four. And then we need to get that signaling from that location to wherever this rack is going to be that does the next gen 911 stuff. And then from that next gen 911 rack, we have to integrate with your CPE. So all of that we have to talk through when we come to your PSAP. So you're probably going to want, when we come do this survey, obviously your center manager or someone who knows that piece of it, probably an IT person will be involved just so that we iron out cable runs and all that. And maybe somebody on the facility side who's doing things related to power uh, and power distribution and physical space requirements in the PSAP. Those are probably the people that we'll have to engage with at every PSAP. All right. So these IP connections that we're delivering, they're used to deliver your 911 calls. So if your IT manager says, that stuff's not coming in my back room, then your response to them is, okay, I'll go tell the chief we, we can no longer be a PSAP. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the conversation. Now, we don't think it'll get to that, but I mean, that, that's like at the layman term, that, that's literally what this means. So we have to find a way to make this work, right? Um, the existing 911 trunks you have coming in now, those are going to stay for a long time until we get all the way through the cutover. Six to 12 months, maybe more. So eventually those will go away and be, we'll use exclusively these IP connections. But I mean, that's really what this is about. So who's ever given you any, has, whoever has questions, or that's how you can break it down for them. Okay? Because if we can't bring the IP network to you, you can't be a PSAP because we have no way to deliver a call. All right. Yes. So much for the ultimate routing of like for like SSD is our uh, PD's backup. Yeah. And we have a shared solution. So when we have our trunks replaced, will we still be able to share one another's trunks, or if we have to go, if our center goes down and we have to go to their center, will will that affect how our our dispatchers on the floor are receiving the calls and they're logging in or or is, there, is it seamless to that? So, so the question has to do with right now the way we bring calls to your PSAP is we bring it in on trunks. And then some of you have inner tandem transfers and other connections that you're leveraging when you want to route a call to somebody else. Uh, how, how will next gen impact that essentially, right? It's going to completely replace it. So today, let's say you've got four trunks coming into your PSAP. So you have four simultaneous calls, right? I'm going to be able to give you 100 at one time. No problem. <laughs> There's no, but the, but the, the point is that that limitation goes away. And once the call arrives and you determine this, this needs to go somewhere else, you can send it anywhere else. It doesn't matter. So we're going to talk through this. I've got a couple slides on it. It's called policy based routing. And we'll talk about the conversations we need to have in order to get that dialed in. But yeah, it's, way more capabilities coming in the back. What about sending to another state? I need to add. Yes. yes. Uh, so the question is, can we send calls to another state? Yes. We will have the ability to transfer to neighboring states. We know right now there's not a huge number of calls in California relative to the 27 million we get a year um, where that happens. But yes, we will build in that capability. We're already talking to Oregon, Nevada, and Arizona to make sure that we've got those um, relationships in place. More importantly, the, the Both, yeah, obviously, bi-directional, absolutely, yes. So your statement about you can't be a PSAP if you don't have a connection, uh, PSAPs that aren't being funded today or EOCs that have been built out by the agencies would not allow you to send calls to those states. 
Okay, so the question is twofold. What happens to PSAPs who are self-funded? That's a whole nother meeting, and we'll see, okay? But same thing applies if they can't receive an, a, a phone call from this 911 network on an IP connection. We're not sure how that's gonna work. So um, are we willing to deliver, bring this connection to an unfunded PSAP? Depends, we're already talking to the military. We had a meeting with the Marine Corps. Of course, they're the most organized and going first. I'm just saying. Um, if you know my background, retired Marine. Uh, so, and we've already talked to uh, Air Force and, and the Army and the Navy as well. So we're starting those conversations. That's the biggest piece of these. So we're engaging with them first. Um, the other question you asked was, um, if you have an EOC with backup and alt answer, so, or backup center. So, Maybe. And when we have our CPE discussion um, at, after the break, I'll talk through that a little bit more. Okay? All right. So obviously, a representative from each company is going to come to your PSAP. Synergym is going to send somebody, and Atos will send somebody, and we'll coordinate that schedule. They're going to do some work, and then they're gonna, you're going to have these four different IP providers that will have to come to your PSAP. Then we'll have to come test those connections. We'll have to install equipment on the end of those connections, test them. And then we'll have to come back again when we go and integrate CPE into this solution, right? When we do that integration, we'll contact your CPE vendor, whoever they are. We'll pay them to come out and do this interface. Obviously, that interface will be tested and vetted in our lab long before it shows up at your PSAP. When we get this thing going and up and running, we'll probably be cutting two or three PSAPs a day. That's what we, uh, other states have been able to do once this thing starts rolling out. And usually those cutovers are very boring. So yeah, we cut, nothing happened. That's the idea. That's exactly what we want. But that, so there's multiple times we're gonna be in your PSAP. We will do our best to make sure this is not disruptive to your operations. But there's just no other way to get this done without that level of coordination, right? Which is why we're talking to you today. So if you have concerns, requirements, hey, you've got to do this in order to get into my back room, we know because of CGIS um, and CLETS requirements, this, this uh, person that comes will have to be escorted. We understand that. If there's any other additional requirements you have, let us know. Any concerns, uh, let us know and we'll vet it. If you're wondering, is it always going to be the same person? No. No, it's, it, it'll be the same company representing behind that person, but it could be somebody different each time, just because of the way the crews are gonna be rotating, going around the state. So any questions? Yes? So the question is, whose responsibility is to coordinate with the CPE vendor? Cal OES will start that conversation, obviously. We will coordinate with the tech, we'll have them on site, we'll coordinate that. Your role in that is to make sure if you've done anything unique, not that CHP ever does, um, or you have a one-off or a special consideration or something that you let us know so that we don't have a gotcha when we arrive. Um, you know, that's, that's the one thing that we would ask. But we will make that coordination and we will test uh, with whatever CPE you've got there. We'll try and get the same version and everything to test against. But no, we will do that. If it comes to this, we'll figure out what the source of the problem is and we'll just work together collaboratively to solve it. Yeah, good question. All right, so obviously the goal is to make sure we don't disrupt your operations. Um, well, that's really what all this is focused about. That's why we're doing these outreach meetings, why we're talking to you today. And we know that communication between us, the vendors, and what you're doing is absolutely critical. Let us know if you have any concerns about these site surveys and these initial steps in the process. As we move through the project, start to think about what do you want to see in a system monitoring display or some type of interface? Like what's something you, you wanted to see? 
If you're worried about ECATs, we're going to keep ECATs. You're going to have that, so we're not, that we're not replacing what you see through ECATs in the near future. All right? We will be able to provide a lot more information than what you're getting today. And so we have a vision of what that system monitoring looks like. And if you have some ideas, share those thoughts with us. Obviously, um, we want to identify trouble ticket reporting, and all that will be part of the training, but we need feedback from you. How's that working? What functionality do you want it to uh, have in it? How can we make it better for you? And then as we get through the deployment, we need feedback from you on how it's going. Hey, this changed after cutover. Um, we know that you, that the, the dispatchers are the best at just making stuff work. It's what you do. It's like, oh, this didn't work the way I thought it would, but let's do this, that, and the other thing. Okay, it's working now. Tell us what it is you want to see and give us some feedback. We may be able to make it easier for you. Um, so we're not asking you to just kind of deal with it. You know, we really, really want your input. And along those lines, one of the things we think we need your input on first is this whole idea of policy-based routing. So anybody ever heard that term before, policy-based routing? A couple of all right. It literally means we can dynamically route that call anywhere, anywhere in the state. Like I said, just for fun, we could send them all to LAPD. We're not going to. We wouldn't do that. You're limited now by the number of trucks that come into your PSAP. That limitation goes away. So we're going to need to know things like, during this time of day, I have four dispatchers on duty. When those four have calls, I want this action to happen when the fifth call comes in. That's what this means. And that action could be, I've got a great relationship with the PD next door, and so when that fifth call comes in, they've got my CAD, they've got access to my radio, so I want that call to go over to them, and they're going to dispatch for me. We could do that dynamically. There could be an incident that comes up, and you just draw a polygon on a, on a, on a map and say, you know what, for this area right here, I've set up incident dispatch. Any wireless call that comes in from this incident area, I want to go to that incident dispatch. We can do that. Like literally, anywhere, anytime, we can send that call under any condition. But you have to help us build those conditions. So initially, yes? So are you saying that you're going to provide a map that we're going to be able to draw on, or the piece that has to have all no. of that? This system will have the ability to, to accommodate that. No. We're not going to make you buy something in order to interface with the system. But we need to know what those are. So initially, we need to know this is how we want the system to behave when you first roll it out. And it's not like a one-stop, okay, I didn't tell you on day one, so now I can't make a change. You, you could change. Um, and so the initial how we design this could be the same as what it works now. I have four trunks in my PSAP, and when the fifth call comes in, they get a busy. Okay, we can do that. But all those scenarios that, that exist down at the local level, let us know and communicate to us so we can start building the policy routing now. And then that policy routing is ultimately maintained by the prime, Autos, and then shared with each region. So that no matter where that call goes in the state, it's routed to your PSAP in the same policy routing through the same policy routing store that everybody is sharing. So that's the idea of this. So literally, everywhere under any condition, we can do routing. All right. So I guess I didn't have that slide up. I could see it, but you couldn't. So what, what happens on a 10-digit transfer? Say a 911 call comes in, and you transfer it on a 10-digit or a 7-digit transfer. What happens to that call? Exactly. It, it's, it's not going to have location. It's going to route out to some 10-digit number, and essentially you're taking a 911 call and turning it into a non-911 call. We need to know those conditions. We know there's a reason why you might be doing that today, but in the new system, the reason for doing that goes away. So we don't want to route 911 calls to 10-digit lines because there's no sense in doing all this work to get this really rich, robust packet built with all this good information in it and then route it over to a phone that can't accept it. So any 10-digit, 7-digit transfers, any automatic rollovers you have and that kind of stuff, we want to talk through those so we can see how we can accommodate them in the policy routing. All right? Um, and then how will all to answer work? So 
You all have a chicken switch in your back room somewhere. Everybody has one. All right. So, you know, when you're bugging out and you want the calls to go somewhere else and you hit the switch and over to the other piece app it goes. So, you may not have ever used that or it might be programmed for an agency that you don't work with all the time and you might want to change that. You may want to do it in different scenarios. It might be under this condition. When I go alt answer, I want it to go there. But under this condition, I want it to go there. We can do that with the system. And you will physically have a switch. We think that's important because whatever you're trained to now, we don't want to change the operational environment dramatically. Um, but it'll just really be just a, like a, a figurative. It, it'll have um, IP and dynamic capability on the backside, but the interface will be the same to you. So think through alt answer. Who's, who's your alternate answer? Where do I want these calls to go? There are no limitations on county boundaries or wait, they're in a different region. None of that matters. Oh, they're on a different selective router. That doesn't matter either. Right? We literally can accommodate any alt answer scenario that you need. We just need you to communicate that to us. Yes. 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 Yep. You can have multiple alt answer scenarios for the same jurisdictions. No problem. We just need to know what those are. Okay. Any other questions on that? So moving forward, our role is to make sure that the, obviously the vendors we've selected are delivering the service needed and we are the conduit bet between you and them to make sure that this is rolling out properly. We have several things in place to do this. Obviously we need your feedback. I'm going to talk about a couple of the mechanisms we've already put in place. Obviously these meetings are a big part of that. We'll continue to work with the 9-1 Advisory Board, the Long Range Planning Committee, and the Regional Task Force that we've got set up to, to help facilitate the conversations that have to go on. We'll establish best practices, policies, procedures, all of that, and we'll define it in our operations manual just like we do today. We'll manage the relationship between the region and the prime vendors and, and we'll coordinate GIS data. I've got a couple slides on GIS here after the break that we'll go through. And we're obviously going to do our, our, take every effort to align what we're doing in California with some of the best practices that we've heard from other states. So anyone who's deploying next to Nima one we are talking to them. We're talking to uh, Nina, the National Emergency Number Association. We're involved, obviously, with the local APCO chapters and anyone else who's active in this space to try and learn here's what works best or here's something you might want to think about before you roll this out. So that's the role we're playing. But you guys have a big part in this. So what we've done is we've set up these regional task force. How many regional task force members do we have in the room? Anybody? There's a couple. One, two, three. Um, and so we know down here at, at the PSAP level you're busy. Maybe due to staffing and other things you just can't participate all the time in these meetings. So we set up these regional task force where you have a representative that can bring your concerns to Cal OES and they have a direct path to our advisory board because if we're the source of the problem and we're not willing to change obviously we need a mechanism for that too. Right? So that's really what this is all about and these groups are really focused on building these relationships and the coordination that needs to happen between you guys and us in order to make this solution a reality. We need your input on what's going on in the region and statewide because we we know the technology, but there's some operational impacts that we just might not have the insight on. So we need your feedback. And what we've done is we've set up these regional task force. They meet quarterly throughout the state. And if you want to know who's on your task force, this is a list of the task force members. So you'll see in the North region, up there in the upper left, those are the folks that are on that committee. The next Northern Region Task Force meeting is? Well, November, 5th. November 5th. So if you're interested in participating, contact Andrew and he will link you up with whatever region that you're interested in, all right? And there's no, no commitment. If you want to come to one and say, okay, I'm good, they've got my interest, I'm fine, that, that works. But if you want to become a member or come more frequently, then, like I said, Andrew can get you on the meeting schedule. He'll let you know where those meeting locations are and you can begin to be part of this process. 
All right, any questions on regional task force? All right, so we're up to the break. We'll take 15 minutes, but before we do, are there any other questions about NextGen? Because when we come back, we're going to transition to these other topics, text, alert and warning, um, location accuracy, CPE, that kind of stuff. So any questions? Yes. Do you know what kind of background the employees for the companies have been selected to go through? So the, the question was, what background have the employees for the companies been through? We can't do a background check on them for you because of CGIS and CLETS requirements. You'd have to do that. So um, even if we did that, we wouldn't be able to. Now, we've asked them, please don't bring convicted felons into the back room. <laughs> we've had that conversation. Um, so they know, and they've communicated with the subcontractors that they're using to do this work. You're coming into a police department. There's rules and regulations and requirements. So they know all of those baseline requirements. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll take 15 minutes. I've got 110. So we'll be back at one, what is that, 125. Let's move on to the next topic. Everyone take their seats, please. We're going to get going. So this next part has been taken um, about an hour, depending on questions. So that if you're wondering about, can I make it to the end, hang in about an hour, we'll be done. All right. Hey, Andrew, you want to get them in from the hallway? Okay, let's quickly get through text to 911 before they get back. It'll be easier for all of us. Um, all right, so a lot of excitement, a lot of questions. Obviously, if you, if you don't get a chance to ask your question today, send it to us. Um, there'll be more opportunities to engage with, what, with us on what we're doing. So the next topic I want to talk about is text to 911. So... Some of you, how, how many of you are taking text right now? You're already taking text. Okay. Anybody not? Can we call you out? Okay. Well, this, this law just passed. And so if you were wondering, am I going to take text? Yes, you are. Uh, and this law clarified that. So AB 1168 essentially says that by January 1st, 2021, every PSAP, and it's pretty specific, every PSAP, we will take text to 911. So we're, the good news is NextGen 911 is the platform that's going to facilitate text to 911 delivery to your PSAP. And Atos is the one that's going to be coordinating that statewide. They're working with a subcontractor, Agent 511. You see them up on the slide. So how's this going to work? For those of you who have text today, we will transition you from either West or Comtech, one of the two text control centers right now. So if you have integrated, you're using West, and if you have over the top, you're using Comtech. So we will transition you from those two TCCs over to this new delivery platform through Agent 511 that's gonna leverage the NextGen 911 system and the new IP connection to deliver that into your PSAP. And so in a perfect world, like we say on the bottom of this slide, um, current t PSAPs that are currently accepting text will be transitioned first and whatever delivery method that you have today we will facilitate that during the transition okay what could possibly go wrong right we've <laughs> got between now and January 1st 2021 so there are some conversations and contracts and agreements that have to be signed between Autos and each of those two TCCs so West and Comtech. And those conversations have begun. And so far, we don't see any gotchas. Um, but we're early in on the conversations. Remember, we're about 30 days into contract signing. If anything goes sideways, and for some reason we can't comply with the law, which if we see anything that jeopardizes the schedule that says there's going to be a slip and we can't meet the requirements under the law, then we may need to regroup and figure a faster deployment method out. And whatever, whatever barriers in the way, we'll have to find a way through it. Uh, the fastest deployment method is a web over the top solution. It's just the fastest method. So at some point in the process, March or April or something we, of 2020, we may say, okay, the, the project's in jeopardy. We may not meet the requirements of the law. We have to pivot and 
you can't do integrated, you can only do over the top, and it'll be delivered through Agent 511 across an IP trunk that we bring to your PSAP. That might be what we have to do. That's not our intent, not where we wanna go, but we can't change the fact that we've gotta have everybody on board by the deadline required in the law. So that's where we are today. Uh, we will know more over the next couple of months as we start to begin those vendor negotiations between Autos and Comtech and West. As soon as we have anything definitive, we'll communicate that back out with you, including our transition plan and what that's going to look like. Okay, so questions, concerns. So the question is, if you don't have text to 911 today, should you continue the process in working with us? Yes. And continue to work with Sharice on my team, and she'll keep you up to date on everything that's going on. Absolutely. Yep. We don't want to slow down the progress we're making, because ultimately, we still need to integrate with those two CCCs to deliver that text and get it into your piece out. So yes, continue, those con to, continue to work directly with them. Yep. Yes. Right, so the question is, does it matter after we get this fully deployed if, if your neighbor's on a different TCC? No. Autos, working with Agent 511, will directly connect with both TCCs. And so some of those limitations that exist now, like if you receive the, the call from one, uh, you receive the text from one TCC and you're integrated and you want to transfer it to the other TCC who's web, you can't do that today. This new solution will solve that problem. Yep, so it won't matter what TCC. All right, other questions on text? Okay, Sharice will be shocked. All right, um, so next, alert and warning. We've had a lot of uh, uh, interaction on this as we've gone out to the town halls. We took a look at alert and warning and what was going on in California, some of the challenges and, and opportunities and capabilities. And we went to the FCC and we said, look, can we spend 911 funds on alert and warning? And they said, yes, it's just reverse 911, uses the same technology, no problem. So then we went to the legislature and to the Department of Finance and we asked, can we get the statutory authority to fund this system? And they said, yes. And then we had to change the revenue and tax code to allow us to include that. And we were able to do that through SB 96 this past year. And then we went to our vendor partners that were bidding on the contract and we said, if we include alert and warning with Next Gen 911, can you support it? And they said, yes. So after all those very simple steps, here we are with an integrated alert and warning solution statewide. And Autos has selected Everbridge as a partner and so they will be, we will be delivering an Everbridge solution statewide. So those of you that are using Nixle or Code Red or Everbridge or some other solution, there's no requirement to use this system. We want to make that clear. Um, but what we've built into this is the capabilities to take every advantage of, of what Everbridge can bring to this solution. So it'll be integrated with iPaws. But remember, iPaws, EAS, WIA, all those require local alerting authority to get the certification to use that. So even though the system is capable of doing it, there's steps you have to do at the local level in order to get certified and trained in order to send out uh, an IPAWS message. So that requirement still stays. Um, we, it'll be fully integrated with the earthquake early warning that Cal OES is deploying. So we built that into the solution and we're gonna leverage everything that's available in the 911 system. <clears throat> So for those of you who have alert and warning today, you probably have to do a refresh of all the phone numbers and addresses, the landlines and all, that, that goes away because we will always have the most current list of phone numbers and address in the 911 system. So that eliminates that step. It's gonna leverage the delivery platform and the IP connections that we have coming into your PSAP, which is good news for you. And obviously, it'll, it'll help us as we meet the requirements under SB 833, 
which required Cal OES to develop best practices and, and provide training for alert and warnings. So much easier to train to a common technology platform than to, you know, 5, 10, 20 different disparate systems that are out there. So um, it, it's also going to be able to support the ability for you, if you have an existing system, to import your local data. So if you've got emails and cell phones and all those, it'll import that. Keep in mind, since cell phones move around, unless you self-register, there's really no way to send a local alert. When I send an iPause or a WIA, there's very specific rules by FEMA of when you can send a WIA, wireless emergency alert. And there are local conditions that don't meet that criteria. So there's often times when you want to send a local message to cell phone users. So we will provide the ability to import all that local alerting that you have. Even local alerting within your agency and all those detailed you know, phone trees and, and uh, that you have existing will incorporate into the system. And this is delivered at no cost to lo local agencies. All right, so any questions before I go on? Yes? So are you saying that if we have Everbridge right now, we will no longer have to pay for Everbridge? You are going to pay for it, but we still have all the same functionality that we have right now? Yes. So the question was, if you have Everbridge today, will the new system support all that functionality? Yes. But we want to make sure you tell us what Everbridge is doing for you now so that we can work with Everbridge to ensure that we've included in the solution what you're doing locally. And we've had some feedback already, and I've pushed that up to Phil uh, with Atos, who's helping to coordinate this. But yes, that's the intent. Okay. Would cell phone users be able to do self-register with your system, or do we still have to maintain a system that they can't register with it? So the question was, will cell phone users register with Cal OES or with the local agency? We, we will see. There will be the ability to self-register, how we coordinate that is, is yet to be determined. Um, we're still in the initial, well, we're well into the conversations between Autos and Everbridge to define those requirements. It seems to make sense that since you are the local authority and the local alerting authority, you should probably maintain that list. I don't need to validate anything. I'm just providing the technology solution. So it seems like that's probably the best way to do it because local, you know, you maintain that authority which is something I have on the next one. Anything we're doing, that third to the bottom bullet there, does not supersede your local alerting authority. Or that's not what this is. This is a common delivery platform only. Yes? So Evergrid, there's a bunch of different functionality, social media integration, you know, weather alerts and stuff that are optional add-ons that some jurisdictions may have now, some jurisdictions may not have. So the current setup, and there's different ways to set it up that you can structure organizations and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of different things out there. So what's the best way for local jurisdictions to communicate what their current setups are, requirements are, and kind of how they're using the system currently to? So, so the question is, Everbridge has the capability to support a whole bunch of additional features, add-ons, and, and um, capabilities. How do you make sure that what you've purchased locally and are using uh, can be built into the statewide system. Tell us your needs. We will push that to Autos, who will talk to Everbridge to see if we can build that into the system statewide. We will make every effort to accommodate all of that. Uh, but we'll find out what those capabilities are once we see the list, and we haven't gotten the list yet. So through like local CSAP providers? Whoever, whoever is an alerting authority and using Everbridge, if you want to send that to, let's see, probably, probably Ann. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Ann. I think this is a prime project manager thing. You're it. So send it to Ann. Uh, send those requests to Ann. Um, obviously, if you send them through your PSAP advisor, if you already know who they are and you don't want to worry about getting Ann's email, send it to them and she'll get it to Ann. But send it to us. We will coordinate that data and send it to Phil. And Phil is actually the project manager over this part of the solution. Um, and him and I have already been talking, and this is not the first set of questions we've had related to this. Uh, as I said, I've actually <clears throat> been requested by my son to lead this effort. He's a uh, firefighter, paramedic for Forest Hill, and they use Everbridge all the time. And he's like, Dad, you're going to fix all the issues we have today. Right? <laughs> so it's not Budge, it's my son that's saying, Daniel, 
you're going to fix it. So uh, we've already had outreach from Placer, Yolo, and Sacramento County. Um, tons of emails flying back and forth already on it. So please go through Anne, and she will <laughs> hook you up with me. You can grab a card from me afterwards if you'd like. But uh, certainly the questions of the so we have those add-on features. I love Budget's comment that everything is included, but yeah, we'll get to the details of some of these add-on packages that they have and, and, and see exactly what they are. So. Yeah, so coordinate with us and we will get it to them. Some of the things we've asked for are on this slide, which we think are really important. So one of the challenges right now with, with IPAWS is you can only give alerting authority down to the county level because at the federal level, they don't know of anything more granular in shapefile than a county. So what that means is Roseville, I know you're in the room, you could have the alerting authority to send it to all of Placer County, even though technically, Roseville, uh, Placer County would probably only want you to be able to alert city of Roseville. We can solve that because we're going to have PSAP boundaries. And so we could do that level of check to make sure that, okay, you are an alerting authority, been through the training and are authorized to do this, and the message and alert you're sending out correlates to the boundary file for your jurisdiction. So we can add that, le that level of... Um, uh, let layer into this solution. The other thing we can do is when there's an alert and warning sent out. I mean, let's say we issued an alert and warning for Auburn. Where do you think they're going? They're just going to come down 80 and they'll be here in a minute, right? I mean, if they evacuate, that's the direction they're coming. So this will provide the awareness to know that a neighboring jurisdiction has sent out an alert and warning, some, some, a capability that may not exist in some of those systems today. So that's another thing we've asked about. Yes. So currently we don't have the capability of doing an alert or warning. The county does it for us. So will this give us the capability to do it within our city jurisdiction? Yes, this will. So the question was right now they don't have alerting authority, but the county does. Yes, but remember if you wanted to send out an IPAWS alert, you as an agency still need to get certified before you could do that. But to use the rest of the system, the local alerting features, th this would support your ability to do that. What's the difference between the iPods? So there are certain requirements for the reason to send the alert to justify an iPods, right? So you can't send an iPods alert for, I don't know, you couldn't send it for some local event doing, what's that? Yeah, for like a red flag. Red flag warning, you can't use iPods, right? But if there was an evacuation, you could use iPods, that kind of stuff. And there's a bunch, and the training has, you know, lots more detail than that. But there's just certain things that you might want to alert locally that don't propagate up to the level that FEMA has said you can use this system for. That's probably the big difference. All right. So um, obviously, um, that we're not trying to supersede any of the local alerting authorities, so we have to figure out a way to solve that in the process, and that's some of the things we're working with Atos on. And it mitigates the problem of all these disparate systems out there. And we want to make sure it's clear this is at no cost to you. I will mention this, though. If you're using grant funding, like EMPG or something else, to fund your local system, once this is 100% up and running, vetted, functioning, working, probably going to need to take a close look because if the state is providing a service and a technology capability uh, it might be challenging to then ask, ask the state for grants to support something locally when we're already providing it to you for free. So those of you who are engaged in this space, we want to work with you over the next what we think is probably going to be 18 to 24 months to get the solution fully deployed and then at that point, you know, we, we think with systems fully up and running and meets all those needs. It's at that point that that grant funding, they may go, eh, mm, no, not, not much sense to do two systems. Okay, any other questions on that? Yes? I think you spoke to this, but <clears throat> just to make sure I heard you correctly, we can still use like the Overbridge platform for internal employee alerting. So if I want to notify employees, like uh, there's overtime for the ship, we currently use Everbridge to notify a group of employees. There's overtime who can fill it. Right, so the question was, if you're using Everbridge today to say notify employees that there's overtime available or any other kind of employee notifications, this system would support that as well. 
Absolutely. Yep. We, we were very clear in the functional requirements there. Absolutely. All right. GIS. The next easy topic to get through. Okay, so we have a GIS task force and they meet periodically and talk through this in a ton of detail. So for this crowd, I just want to let you know where we are today and what we're doing. So we hired this company called DDTI, Digital Data Technologies Incorporated. They're based out of Ohio to come in and take our Annie Alley data, our MSAG data, road center lines that we could pull from locals and, and address points. We got about 80% uh, that sent in their data. And they took all that data together and combined it together with um, a commercially available data set called Tiger Data. It's the census data, which is the most valid publicly available data set we could get um, that really exists out there. We took all that together and we're running it through a process in order to develop the GIS data set that we need to route a 911 call. This is not the GIS data set we need to dispatch somebody. There is, this is completely different, although related. So I'll walk you through how this works. In today's world, when you call 911 from a landline, it goes out to the Annie Alley database and then says, okay, this telephone number equates to this emergency services number, which means this call needs to be routed to that PSAP. And the selective router is hardwired to send the call to that PSAP. That's how it works today. In the new world, the way this is going to work is that address has been validated to be inside the shape file for your PSAP. So when that call comes in, it turns it into a lat long, compares it to the shape file, says that goes to this PSAP, builds the header of the SIP packet, says it goes to that location and sends the call to the PSAP. How many county coordinators do we have in here? A few of you. Oh, wow, really good. So for county coordinators, that's essentially what this new process looks like, where today you get an address in and you make sure it's MSEG valid. It's in the valid set of address ranges. Um, the company that Atos is working with is called Geocom, and they're going to establish a process and training so that you can do just that. New address comes in, they will, it will plot to a lat long. You'll see that lat long shows up in this shape file. That shape file is, in fact, the PSAP it's supposed to go to. And now the 911 system would be, will be able to function as it's supposed to. Keep in mind that the current Annie Alley system today costs about $20 million a year to do relatively little. And I say relatively little because it's only there for non-wireless calls. 80% of your calls are wireless. So while it uses parts of that system to deliver that wireless call, it's really focused on wireline and voice over IP. So we need to take those addresses, get them into this new space so we can turn off Annie Alley and MSAG, replace it with this new system so that we can continue to route 911 calls. Then we take that money we've saved and we roll it into the project that everybody really wants to do, which is a coordinated statewide GIS addressing space that we can get to to do all the other things we want to do in GIS. If we try to get to that step today, like we try to get from where we are with GIS today, all the way to that coordinated GIS validated address valid wonderful data set we all want, it would be 2050 before we finish that effort. Literally. So we will get there. This is step one. We know but there are many things that we need to interact with you on for this GIS data set. So what we've done is we've replaced the old GIS funding model. So how many of you are taking wireless calls? Everybody's hand goes up. The purpose of the previous GIS um, funding model we had out there was so you could take wireless calls. It was one-time funding. It was in place for 17 years. Anybody who contacted me and said, oh, we didn't get a chance to use our GIS funding for wireless calls. That was 17 years. You, you, 17 years. I mean, that's a pretty slow moving boat when it was going by the dock, 17 years. That, and so, uh, we, I mean, we know there were a few that didn't get to use it, but it's gone. And this is the new one right here. So what we've done is we looked at really PSAPs um, and number of positions and all that is not the important 
factor when we're calculating this new GIS model. It really has to do with how many address points do you have in your county. So we took a look at the number of address points that are in California, which is a publicly available number, it's because I needed a budget for this. And I need to go to Pat, my boss, who's in the back. And I think I've been doing pretty good so far because he hasn't thrown anything at me. Um, so we, we, we needed to be able to budget for this. So we took the number of address points, and if you calculate it out at 44 cents an address point, that's the statutory amount that I can spend on this project this year. So if you're a county with multiple cities in that county, and you have those address points that you maintain, then we want you to work with the cities to validate those addresses, and the number of address points don't change, so if, say there's a city, say Roseville, you want to do your own addressing, which you'd probably do. You would work with Placer County, who's got this allocation of 44 cents for the entire county, and then you get a portion of those addresses that you're responsible for, and then we would direct reimburse you for any time uh, to do this work that's needed for GIS. Okay, so that's how the funding policy is set up. Andrew, do you remember the number of address points, or, well, Natasha, do you remember? Total number of address points in California. I don't remember, it was, it was in the millions. I don't remember the number, but I have it. I just don't know it off the top of my head. 14 million, is that right? I don't know. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So I think it was like 14 and a half million or something is the number that comes to mind. Um, so that's, that's how we came up with the funding policy. This is the first version of it. We have a GIS task force. How many are on the task force in the room? One, two. So um, there's a couple that are on that task force. We'll relook at this funding policy for next year, which will start in July of 2020. And we may find that that 44 cents number needs to go up or down or get adjusted based on the level of effort that's required. So. What can you get reimbursed? These are the activities that will support through this funding model. Um, road center lines, address points, and bound, PSAP boundary files. And that's to reimburse the time you need to do at the local level in order to support this effort, or if you want to go out and get a subcontractor or a contractor to help you with that work, we would be able to direct pay them, them direct pay them, provided they're on CMAS, which is the state contract, all right? But if you do work with a contractor, make sure you talk with us because we want to make sure your statement of work includes only things we'll support so you don't get left holding the bill for something that's not on this list. So the, the data set that DDTI is building will be transitioned in December and January over to Geocom, and then Autos working with Geocom will maintain that data set. And then they're working with another company called 911 Data Master, which will build a LDB, a location database, which is essentially like an alley, but in the next gen 911 world. So that's what we're doing with GIS. So questions? No questions. How exactly define GIS analysts? Yeah, so you're, you're, the question was, will a local GIS analyst be involved in this? Probably. So one of the challenges we're coming up with is when we, when we got the address points and we run them through our system, remember we're focusing on it to make sure, is it a valid address point, you know, and, and can we, do, does it have what we need to be able to route the 911 call? When we find an error or we find a change, we would like to push that back to your local analyst to make that correction. That's what this project is focused on. But if you don't make the change, we still will. Like we are still going to correct the data so we can route 911 calls correctly. But at some point, we want this data set to align with what you have locally. And we know those workflows are going to take time to work out because as a PSAP, you may not have authority to make changes to the GIS. That could be the city manager or the police chief or someone at the county level or somebody in another county department that you have to coordinate with. And so those are the workflows long term we need to work out with this process. So there's, there was a question here. How do you handle non address locations like the So the question was how do we handle non address locations like the highway? So we'll have a PSAP boundary file for the highway. And so when a mobile call comes in that boundary, it will route to CHP. 
Um, most, if there's any other address that's, that's on a highway that shouldn't go to CHP, we would need to know about that to be able to program it into the system. Yes. So the question is twofold. For a state highway that has a boundary, and you, let's say you live on a state highway, your address is the state highway, because you, that's your landline address. But when you call 911, CHP is not the one that would respond, local PSAP would or sheriff or something like that. Yes, we will accommodate that in the, route, in the routing policy to be able to do that properly. Even if the address point physically falls in a CHP boundary, but we know it's a wireline call, it's very easy to make the policy routing update to say that call goes to the, to the sheriff or to the PSAP. Same thing applies for the Capitol. If there are wireless calls that are generated from inside the Capitol and you want those to go to CHP and not Sacramento PD, that can be built into the system as well. Absolutely. So don't think that if this is not all 100% figured out on day one that the call is lost. There's always a default routing policy to get this call to a PSAP. And that's part of that policy routing discussion that we need to have. Every county might be a little different. In some counties it might be, if you can't figure out where to send this call, then it goes to the SO. Others may say, if this call needs a default route, it's CHP. Others might be, if you need a default route, it's that PD. We can build all that into the system. So no matter what, the call will get to the right place. And here's the good news. We will have the analytics to figure out where the call should have been, and we will be able to correct the policy routing so that it doesn't happen again, so that it goes to the right PSAP the first time. So I think there was one other question back here. What if, like, for problems, like calls that are routed wrong, or, like, how do you fix it? Like, right now, on the inside file, you're fixing, like, addressing corrections and things. How is that going to come into it? So so the question is, how do we make corrections? There will be an interface that's developed by Geocom. We will train the county coordinators on how to work with that interface to make those corrections to the routing. We'll also have a feedback mechanism the other way because this system will say, look, this call arrived here but was transferred there. Why are we transfer this? Let's send it to that PSAP. So the system will say, this is the recommended destination for that call. Reach back out to you. Do you agree? Do you agree that this call should not go here, it should go there? And then we can update the policy routing for that. All those are, are built into this process that we're talking about. Absolutely. Will the data correction involved in the PSAPs? Yes, the PSAPs are going to be involved in that. Just like today, the way we do our route wireless routing project. So um, for those that don't know, we go through the state. There's roughly 400,000 cell sectors in the state of California. And we take a look at where that call gets routed. And then if it's transferred, above a certain rate from one cell sector to another, then we work with CHP and the local PSAP to make sure it routes. Same kind of process will be built into this. Yeah. Yes. I know that any LA going away with the system, is there any template of what the, the new display will look like or include in terms of? Be exactly the same. The 512 bytes that spill in your anti alley spill from CPE to CAD will be exactly the same in the new system. Uh, with the exception, it will be more accurate. Okay. Well, like your telephone information will still be there for the Exactly. Okay. Yep, all that will still be in there. In the back. What about elevation? So the question is, what about elevation? We have begun to talk about Z-axis and how we can incorporate it. Um, if we receive it, we can deliver it. But again, we're limited to that 512 bytes in the Annie Alley spill and some other challenges we have there. So. The, the system, the NG911 system can handle it. Probably the bigger conversation is how do we deliver that data to PSAP in a way that you can ingest it. So that's a follow-on discussion. Okay, there was another question. So that 500 and whatever bytes, um, can we look at changing that because 
So the question is, can we change the 512 Annie Alley spill? We want more data. Um, because you want more data. Yes, we can, but we're going to make a lot of people mad. So that's part of the conversation we're starting to have. Right now we have this limitation, right? We get all this rich data set. I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides. So hold that thought. We'll get to there. Yes. So, question is, what kind of accuracies? Do you mean with wireless? Yeah, with wireless. All right. Yeah. So, let me answer that question in about five slides on accuracy, or six, because I have a. We'll talk about the rapid deploy project and some of the work we're doing there on location accuracy. All right. So, um, other updates we've made. Uh, in addition to the GIS funding model, we made an update and we've increased your training allotment from $3,000 per PSAP per year to $10,000 per PSAP per year. We know there's a lot of technology coming and we want to support the training that you need in order to meet this, this kind of here's what's coming. So that went into effect in, in July, so it'll be $10,000 uh, per fiscal year per, per PSAP. This supports training like NINA training, APCO training, POST training, and any other 911 training that you coordinate with our office. So reach out to Paul Troxel on my team who will um, work with you. So if you come up with some 911 training and you want to get it pre-approved, it's got to be pre-approved, uh, and it's not NINA, APCO, or um, POST, then we may still be able to authorize it depending on what that training is. It's got to be 911 training, so you can't do like bake sale training or, you know, all those, are, and that's important, I know, but um, we have to be really careful what we fund here. We've also update, updated the approved list of authorized use of residual funds. So um, take a look at that updated list to see what's on it, and the idea is that we're trying to identify those critical elements you need in PSAP in, in order to support 911. So look at our residual funding list. We want feedback on this. We had a really lengthy discussion yesterday at the long range, day before yesterday, uh, at the long range planning committee on what should be on that residual funding list. All right, so we, we've added back in furniture if you're wondering what the big change was. Um, so. Um, but, but there may be other things that should be on that list. We want to know about that, right? So take a look at what's on there, and if there's something you need to support your PSAP for 911 calls, let us know. The last one is just a reminder. This project's getting a lot of visibility. So the legislature's watching. Um, some of you probably saw the announcement recently where Governor Newsom went to San Francisco uh, to the PSAP there. Not, not sure how long it's been where a governor actually went into a PSAP, but I think it's been a little while. So one of the things that they've started to ask us at the 911 branch is, hey, what are the call answer times for this PSAP? Because once they start looking at the 911 system, they want data. When they ask me for that data, I have to give it to them. This is a public record act. The data is available. I have to provide it for them. So just a heads up. Make sure you're really looking closely at what you're doing operationally because the folks might start coming around asking questions, okay? That's an important project with a lot of visibility. All right, let's talk about technology. And we'll finish up on this topic, really. I think I've got about six or seven more slides. So there's a lot of uh, technology that you have in your PSAP. And we're going to talk about some of the trends we are seeing and, and where we see the path forward. And then we want to get your reaction. Right now, about 50% of the calls that come into your PSAP, to, to the question earlier, the location is just not good or not at all in some cases, right? We know that. It's a huge limit. We know that this 512 bytes of data that goes between CPE and CAD is a, is a huge limiting factor, and we're gonna have to find a way to break through that barrier in the near future, all right? We also know that there's a lack of ability to integrate new technology. We get a really good idea, and we come to the PSAP, and we say, can you integrate this with your CPE? And no, you can't, unless we do a forklift upgrade or some other type of infrastructure overhaul in order to integrate that new technology. 
There's a slow deployment and refresh cycle. Every five to seven years, we buy new equipment. And if you want something outside of that cycle that requires new equipment, we just have to wait. This is basically what we have to do, which is a huge problem. Challenge, uh, lack of reliability. We're seeing even most of your CPE on average statewide is, is only three nines reliability. So what that means is the standard is five nines, which is about six seconds of downtime per month. We're seeing 10,000 hours of downtime per month for three nines. That, that's the difference. I mean, it's just orders of magnitude difference in reliability. And we want to increase that. We want to make your systems available. And we want to be able to integrate these new technologies that are coming both in the emergency management space and in the 911 space. And there's limited security. So, or no security, right? Most of you, your security is a moat that's around your PSAP, right? So in the 1300s, that was pretty cool. Uh, not so much anymore. This is a lot different, big difference of what security requirements we need today. There are probably some in this room who have probably had a TDOS or DDoS or a ransomware attack in the last year. I won't ask you to raise your hand because that's kind of scary. But we actually want to do real security, like to sec secure these systems the way that they should be. So we started thinking through this and we asked ourselves, how do we get there? Cloud is probably where we're headed. Not probably, it is where we're headed. All right, and it's actually here. Of the four vendors that we selected for this project for NextGen 911, one of them has a 100% cloud solution, NGA 911. And we know that Autos has cloud as part of their delivery, and CenturyLink has cloud as part of their delivery, and Synergym is working on cloud as well. This is where we're headed. And for those of you who are thinking, oh, cloud, are you out of your mind? How many of you have used your mobile phone to access your bank account? Mm, so it's okay for that, right? So clearly there's a way to get it right. There's, there's a right way to do cloud computing. And we in 911, I think we really have a choice. We, we can sit back and wait and see what industry is going to deliver for us as they tell us what they think is best. Or we can say, you know what? We're going to embrace this. Let's figure out the functional requirements we need from a 911 community, from a public safety community, and let's drive industry to give us the solution we want. So that's the role we're taking for the reasons that you see up here on this slide. We want to get out of this technology refresh cycle that limits our ability to really deliver the services that we need to in the PSAP. So that's really where we're headed. So what does that mean? Well, there's some things that are important when you consider cloud-based technology. You want to make sure that you're using a bona fide cloud provider and not just Bill and Ted with two servers in their garage, right? I mean, you just, it, so these are some of the things to look for. So if you're trying to get into this technology um, and you're in the, the IT field and you're, you're a decision maker here, this is the things we looked at as we start to think about cloud-based solutions. First of all, FedRAMP certified. So this is a way to, to validate that this is a true um, cloud provider. So services like Amazon Web Service, Microsoft Azure Cloud, Google Cloud, those cloud providers like that have FedRAMP certified. So that's the first step. That means that the platform can support the reliability you need in 911. You also want to make sure that whoever you're working with as a vendor has a cloud engineer who actually understands this stuff because it'll be up to that, that provider to interface with this FedRAMP solution in order to deliver what you need. You want to make sure that it's high availability. The way you do that, there's a thing called an instance. So you could think of, you know that rack of equipment you've got in your back room? That's the instance. You have multiple of those in the cloud active at the same time, both capable of carrying 100% of the load. So if something is impacted in one, it doesn't affect the other and you still continue to get your service. And it's gotta be dedicated space for your solution, right? So that's really what this is all about. And that's what we're focused on with this solution. You've also gotta have secure network connections in place because now your connection to the cloud becomes absolutely critical which is why we're gonna bring six different connections into your PSAP where possible. 
right? That's, that's how we get to this level of reliability. And it's got to be dedicated and secure. So you want a private closed network that meets the solution you're deploying. And, you, you know, uh, it's, it's got to be secure. It's got to follow all of the security requirements that are out there. And it's kind of a difficult space to wander through. So the IP, I, IT people that are in the room, can you say, is there a definitive security requirement that if I've met this, I've done everything? No. There's a whole bunch of different sources. There's some guidelines and tools and stuff that are out there, but you've got to be able to be following those in order to make sure that this is compliant. So what are we going to do with this? Like I said, we're already using this for NextGen 911. I'm going to talk about another project, but the next thing we see coming is CPE. We want to move CPE from on-prem into the cloud or a data center model, right? So we want to move to this evergreen type solution so that it's always available, always updated, meets the current standards and can integrate any technology. So we're working on an RFP right now. We'll release it in the winter, uh, it's probably November, December timeframe. We'll release a draft or, an, or a pre-solicitation, we call it. It'll be the full RFP, and we want you guys to give us some feedback, okay? There's going to be a couple of unique features with it. One of them is we're moving away from this per position cost model. Right now, it's, everything's per position, right? So when you come to me and you say, hey, Budge, I want a couple more positions for training, I say no. I need a couple more positions for a backup center, no. The reason is I pay per position. We have roughly 3,000 positions in California. So if I told everybody yes to back up, those 3,000 positions turn into 5,000 positions and I break the budget and I can't afford to support the system. That's why we tell you no today. We want to go to, to a model where I price it based on your call volume. You all know your call volumes. We've known them for a decade or more and they don't change very much. So we want to establish these tiers that says from like zero to 1,200 calls, it's this cost because that's how big the instance needs to be in the cloud to support your needs at PSAP. So it's a fundamental shift. Yes? Coming from a center that roughly 40% of our call intake came on uh, 10 digit landlines because of the advent of all the medical alarm companies, fire alarm companies, how is this going to translate into that? So the question is, how do we accommodate in this model your incoming 10-digit calls that are actually 911 calls? That's, that's good feedback. So we'll figure out a way to count those. But don't try and plus up your numbers by a bunch of 10-digit stuff that's not really 911 to get a bigger pot of money. So I'm going to have to find the balance there. But that's a good point. If, if there's something coming into the system that is a 911 call, we, we want to accommodate that. Remember, we're going to establish ranges, and it's quite unlikely that you have enough to bump you to the next range. But when you see this come out in the winter, take a look and give us some feedback on it, right? And, and that's this next bullet, really. We want your input on this. When we post this, we want you to tell us what you think and focus in on it from a functional requirement. So don't tell me I need six buttons and I want that one yellow and I want that one blue. And I need, that's, that's not the kind of feedback we need. I need programmable buttons that have the ability to do these functions. That helps me. That kind of feedback really helps to make sure that this um, contract that we eventually put in place meets your needs. Our goal is to have the contract in place in the summer of 2020. We'll extend the current CPE contract probably a year to give us a little overlap where both contracts are there. And then at some point, which, once this is in place and vetted and everything, this will be the path forward. And then we will take one-time cost, that's what we'll pay for your positions for, right? So that, that's a one-time, it's not tied to the maintenance of the system. So that's the vision. Yes? Um, I'm looking at this in terms of like a money thing for the center. So will there be any way that the manager could look and see like, well, how much would I get if I decided to do the her position while you're still doing it, is while you're looking at transitioning to the call volume one, or is there gonna be, you have to pick and choose which one you will 
Right, so the question is, is, is there a way to look at what the funding model is going to look like in this new scenario with a cloud-based or data center CPE versus the on-prem that we have now? Yes, you will be able to see that. But remember, we cost that based on that master services agreement. So the per position cost is actually based on the, the responses that come back to us. So um, I think it might actually went down this last year by a little bit because the price of the systems that we negotiated were cheaper. In the new model though, probably the bigger question along funding is, what do you do about those reoccurring costs that come up? Because this will be an evergreen solution, which goes back to that, please help me have a conversation on these incidentals that you want me to, to that I need to fund in PSAP so we can develop a regular routine for that as well. Um, I don't know, logging recorders or whatever the whatever the, the 911 piece of equipment is that won't be part of this that still needs to be funded at the PSAP. Headsets, the thin client interface that's receiving the 911 call. We need a regular equipment cycle, refresh cycle on those. That'll be part of this new funding model as well. We've already begun talking to the Long Range Planning Committee, um, which is part of the 911 Advisory Board on this, and, and we'd like to get some input from you. Yeah, and again, all that, you, you know, you'll see that in the full RFP that's released. Yes? So, right, so the question is, what do we do if I'm ordering, in the process right now of ordering equipment? Depending on where you are in your existing maintenance, how happy you are with the solution you're negotiating right now would probably answer that question. If, and, and more than likely, probably makes sense for you to keep going, but talk to us and we'll see. We, we'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to figure that out. Probably the bigger question for planning is, what do I do if I'm in year four right now, right? Which meaning next year I would come up. Definitely gonna wanna take a look at this new model because we're probably gonna be able to deliver more services to you than what's currently available on the contract. All right, and this is what started this conversation really was this next project I'm gonna talk about. Um, we needed a way to display in PSAP this location information that's being sent by Google and Apple or Android devices and Apple devices through a clearinghouse that's managed um, by Rapid SOS, so you could see this device-based data, right? So we went looking for a company that could deploy a solution. Well, first we started and said, look, we'd love to integrate this with all the equipment you've got at your PSAP. Nobody could integrate it, or very few can integrate it. Maybe 10% could integrate. So we had to figure out a way to deliver this into every single PSAP. So we went looking for a company that could do that for us. That's when we found Rapid Deploy. So Rapid Deploy was selected to, de to bring this location accuracy project into every PSAP. So how many have Rapid Deploy in your PSAP today? All right, what are your thoughts? Give us some feedback. Good? What, what do you like about it? All right. So, that's the feedback we've heard. You can tell exactly where somebody is on every single 911 call, every single wireless 911 call, which is 80% of your call volume. Anybody else have any comments? So I'll show you a graphic on that in a second, but essentially with the, this rapid deploy solution, it automatically rebids and plots the breadcrumb trail as the caller's moving. So I wanted to give your feedback before I introduce somebody from Rapid Deploy who's actually here, so you could feel free to say whatever you wanted. So Samantha, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi everyone. Some of you might have heard from me uh, via email. I'm Samantha Greer. I'm the project manager for the Cal OES Location Accuracy and Validation Project. So right now we've installed in 48 uh, PSAPs. Uh, Kurt from Cal OES, who's the project manager um, on the Cal OES side, he's uh, sent out a project package for you all to sign. Um, so far we've received 168 back um, as part of our next deployment phase. 
I sent out 168 emails yesterday to all of those PSAPs. So if you have signed your project packages and you did not get an email from me, please find me after and we'll touch base and connect and figure out why you didn't get that email. But um, we're really excited about this project and moving ahead with the next phase. All right, so thank you. So I'm gonna show you kind of what the interface looks like. So if you can look up on, on the screen here, when, when that wireless call comes in, that big blue circle you see there, or maybe triple the size of it in some cases, would be phase one, what comes into the piece out. Essentially, you know there's a caller somewhere, right? It's not very helpful. Um, and then if you do a rebid, in a best case scenario, you get that smaller blue circle you see. Um, my, I, like I said, I can't point, so it's kind of, but anyway, the smaller blue circle. And then if you look close, you might be able to see a little small red circle around that number two uh, that's on the screen. That's what it's going to look like for the, the call that comes through from the Rapid SOS Clearinghouse into this um, display that you see here. And the next graphic kind of shows the breadcrumbs we were talking about. So when the initial call comes in, it's that number 11 you see up there. Um, that would be the wireless um, Annie Alley spill that's coming. And then as the caller moves, you actually get a bread trail crumb in real time of where that caller is. So when we deployed this in Roseville, we did a call. Um, there was a, somebody uh, in a vehicle and the phase two came in and then they drove two miles and literally, okay, I'm crossing this street. And you'd look and boop, the pin drop would drop exactly where they were as they were moving. We even did an Annie Alley rebid in the middle and it didn't change at all. I mean, it still plotted them back at their original location two miles away. And many of you have probably seen that uh, challenge with the existing system. So this is what um, this project is all about. There are a couple of challenges. Like I said, if, if you have CAD that can integrate this directly, we'll do that. We absolutely will. Most of you probably don't, probably none of you do. Um, so we will bring in uh, the way that you access the system. I'll walk through kind of at a high level um, what it looks like. But this is some feedback we got from Kings County. So if you read through this story, essentially what happens, driver crashes, goes into a ditch, car's filling up with water, pre-diabetic, not sure where they are, can't provide their location. Of course, phase two, can't exactly locate a car off a ditch, not visible from the road. So through the rapid deploy data, they were able to pinpoint within five meters where that car was and dispatch resources and save this guy's life. I mean, this is the kind of data that's coming through and these kind of success stories we're hearing statewide. So how do we get there? How does this get into your PSAP if you're one of the, not one of the 48 that already has it? So what we will do we will connect up a, a Y connector working with your CPE vendor onto the back of your CPE. So it takes that Annie Alley spill that's going into CAD and plugs it into this edge device that Rapid Deploy um, will supply. The edge device will be installed by an AT&T technician at all PSAPs, right? And then Cal OES will come and install a Cradle Point router to bring that secure connection up to the Azure cloud. The purpose of that is that's how we're getting any alley from your PSAP into this, this Azure cloud solution, all right? That cradle point router, we will come into your back room and do a test and whatever signal strength is the best, that's what we will use, right? So we'll test T-Mobile, FirstNet and Verizon. Whoever has the best throughput, that's the one we're gonna use. Some of you, your back room is a concrete bunker buried three stories underground. Uh, when we find those situations, we may need an antenna. And so we'll talk to you about what that looks like and how we do an antenna. Uh, the goal is to avoid that though. We know touching infrastructure at the PSAP can get tough. And then the other thing we're doing for this secure connection is we're working with Comcast. They've already completed install at two locations or four. And they've done surveys at over 100, I think. Almost? Okay. So eventually, there will be another connection at PSAP to support this, all right? Not just LTE. 
Once it goes up into the cloud, that's where you have access to the data. It's a Chrome browser interface where you have this mapping analytics tool that displays those graphics that I showed you, in addition to other information that's available, other information that might be available from Rapid SOS, which is the company that manages the clearinghouse, or from Rapid Deploy. And that Rapid Deploy can bring um, things like live traffic, weather, other API, uh, and other feeds. If there's something you want to integrate into your map, talk to them and they'll see if there's an API that they can support in order to bring that data into the map, right? We leave that up to you. Our, our focus is on getting the location. And then what we're doing in addition to this, and this is a big part of this project, we're trying to overcome the limitation that a cell sector has to be sent to only one PSAP. Now, we talked about that earlier. So I'm trying to validate this location that's coming from the device so we can actually route on that location. Right? Then I can get the call to the right PSAP every single time, which is the goal. So we've got some analytics that we're running in the back, which is why we need that edge device installed in every PSAP, even if you're going to integrate it or even if you don't want to use the rapid deploy mapping solution. So that's what we're doing in the background. We're running some analytics and what we're seeing is roughly 80% of the wireless calls that come in have this S rapid SOS data and in general it arrives faster and is much more accurate. So that's the project. So as Samantha said, um, any questions before I go on with the deployment strategy? Yes? I just want to make sure I understood what you just said last. So eventually then your guys' goal is to use Yeah, so the question is, what are we going to, how are we going to route calls in the next gen 911 environment? Do we intend to use this data? Yes. So we've talked to the FCC and there's no regulatory restrictions from doing that. We have to work with Rapid SOS and Google and Apple to make sure that there's no contractual limitations. We're in those conversations now. But before we get there, we want to make sure we vet the data and validate it that it's worth routing on. Other than just obviously what we're already seeing in the interface. You know, we want to actually do some testing. And so we'll be doing that over the next couple months. And then, yes, that would be the intent. Yeah. We hope we can get there. Yes. Alicia. I think there was one more over here. Yeah. How are you validating that the data that you're receiving from Rapid Deploy is the correct dispatch So the question was, how are you validating the data from Rapid Deploy is the correct dispatchable location? We're not, nor will we ever, because dispatchable location is ridiculous. Well, no, I, mean, like, I can tell you the location of the 911 caller, yes. which is way different than the dispatchable location. We want to make that very clear. If I'm driving down the freeway and I call 911, the dispatchable location is not my car. So, but that's a really important distinction because there's a lot out there that are confused on this topic. The dispatchable location is where you need to dispatch, which is not to the location of the caller every time. Probably in most cases, right? It's not the caller. But I'm going to validate the location of the caller that I can do. So I will take a device where I know the GPS location of the device place a 911 call, and then validate what Annie Alley says is the location of that caller, and then validate what Rapid Deploy is saying is the location of that caller. Absolutely. It's the only way to do it. With all four carriers. Yes, indeed. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, I really want to make sure we understand dispatchable location is a different conversation, and it's going on out there, and it's, uh, it can cloud things up. There was a question over here. Yes. They're not integrated. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding so I can explain to my people. There's no change to our end user since we are not integrated right now. It's still going to be, it's going to feel the same to them. It's just a matter of the equipment in the bathroom. I, I think there would be one important difference. With, with Rapid Light, it's a manual lookup that you have to. We're one of the big testers, so uh. we have. Very similar. Phase one people are already, yeah. already installed. Yes. So it's truly just equipment being installed versus us going to their 
website. Well, I, I, I don't know, are you think. getting confused? With, are you beta testing with rapid SOS? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with, with we're, we're in the beta testing where we no longer have Okay, I don't know about that program or yeah. that project, so that's but, completely separate to this one. Um, yeah. There might be a distinction between Rapid Deploy and Rapid SOS yeah. here. Um, yeah. Can you confirm your agency? Separate of police department. Okay, so, um, so today would be Rapid Light. Uh, user right. Yeah. So after this, we'll get together and we'll see what might what, what changes, if any, would, would happen for you. Okay, that's a good question. And then there was another, yes. So the, the data that you're getting, does it show if we have a country like Calaveras, we might get an one that we have transfer CHP because a lot of our 911 calls are highly related to the transfer CHP. Is it going to show that transfer? Is it going to show that that was a... So transfer? if it comes in as a 911 call, yes, you will get the data, even if it's transferred in as a 911 call. It show you that that transferred on the 911 and that that so it'll show you the exact location of that caller and then when you answer that call if it's still intended for CHP you would still have to transfer it no doesn't mess up the data so, looking at the deployment schedule, um, like we said, we've already deployed at 48 locations. Um, we're validating this information, which is the purpose of that edge device and why that's in there. Comcast is working on that 10 meg fiber connection into every PSAP, and they're working with a few partners, um, including Charter, Cox, and in some locations, they may have to leverage the connections through the telephone companies like AT&T and others. Um, there's only a few of those, less than, less than 20 where they have to do that. Um, all the remaining PSAPs will be scheduled to be deployed by the end of this year. Cal OES technicians will be installing the um, cradle point routers, and then your CPE technician will install the, the, the Y connector into your CPE if it's not already in there, and an AT&T tech will install the cradle point router. We've noticed that um, it there was a lot of feedback on how do we get the call record data if I get called into court or something and I need these records. So there's a process built into the system where you can make that request in less than 24 hours you get that data and it's usually much, much less than that, two to six hours. I don't know, has anybody done a request in the room yet? Okay, so we a couple others at other PSAPs are saying it, it happened very quickly. Um, this is where we are. We've sent the email. Samantha gave, gave a great update on that, so I don't have to read through most of this information. But when you get that slide, if you have any questions, our project manager is Kurt Galat. He's standing right in the back. Uh, you can send an email to him. His email is just kurt.galat at caloes.ca.gov. If you deleted his email, uh, you can either go <laughs> check your deleted box and get it, because there's some good stuff in there, or reach out to him, and, and he'll uh, get you that back. Also, you'll expect an email from Samantha, same process. If you didn't get it um, or it went to your spam or something, uh, reach out to her directly and you can get that information. They also provide training. And when we deployed this at Palo Alto, uh, in less than, just to give you an idea how fast this is and the power of cloud tech computing, the Y cable is already connected when we got there. So we got on scene within 15 minutes. Edgebox was installed. LT router was synced up and we were receiving live data at the dispatch positions in the dispatch center. 30 minutes of training and they were able to interface with the system no problem. So is that kind of those in the room pretty similar to your experience? I mean this is um, pretty cool how fast this rolls out. I don't know how many of you have done a new technology integration in less than 45 minutes but probably not too many of you. <laughs> So that's really, it's, it's a pretty powerful tool, and uh, we're pretty excited about continuing this rollout. So I want to end talking about this. Sometimes we'll reach out to you and ask, hey, give us a success story. Give us some feedback. Well, you obviously can tell us no. You can tell the vendor no. We have no problem with that. We, 
We at OES can't endorse a single vendor, so we are, we are very mindful of that. But if you can share these success stories, success stories about rapid deploy, success stories about next gen 911, and some of the other things we're doing, I want to give you a sense of what these companies are doing with that data. So everyone that's in the room, whether it's Rapid Deploy or Synergym or NGA 911 or Autos or I don't know, is there any, who else? I don't know, there's probably other vendors in the room too. Frontier, AT&T, all these companies, they sit on these national boards, committees, standards bodies, and they need a reason to justify their existence to their executives who are sponsoring their time, energy, and resources on our behalf in order to participate in all this work. That's where these good news stories go. So if you have some good news stories, share them, because that's the work that they're doing at the national level that some of you just may not be aware of, right? Again, if you can't share the data, then say no. I mean, it's that simple. But that's the reason why we ask. Um, I've even been told by our executive leadership in Cal OES, you need to do a better job, Budge, of telling the good news story of all the great things that are happening in 911. And we lose sight of that. This is just what we do, right? Why am I going to toot my own horn? This is just what we do every day. But it's important to help us get visibility on some of the things that we're doing uh, for 911. So with that, we have six more or five more of these um, in the south and in LA uh, and in the central region. I think we have one more as well. So if you had someone who couldn't be at this meeting, take a look at the schedule. It's very similar. Not exactly the same everywhere we go, but very similar, and see if they can participate. This one today was recorded, and we will make it available on our website, so obviously there'll be a YouTube session that you can refer back to. It'll take us a couple weeks at least to get it posted maybe longer, so you've got that opportunity as well. If you want the slide deck, send an email to um, Andrew Matson on my team, and we'll make sure we get a copy of that slide deck to you. So any last questions? Yes, right here. Um, earlier in the presentation, you had talked about the alley and mandatory room and deploy change, and it would be implemented the same way. Is that the intention to retain it, re you know, keep it that way, or will the rapid deploy type location eventually become what we see in the alley? Because I think it's important, too, with this process of making sure that there's still the individual person putting those pieces together right now. And we're logging in now to an over-the-top tech solution and now an over-the-top location solution and all of those. So making sure that that's actually intended to merge at some point. In the so the question is, are we going to merge together all these over the top? You're doing text over the top through a web interface. You've got rapid deploy through an interface. And then you've got this other location that's coming through Annie Alley. Yes. Next Gen 911 is going to merge all that together. So the best location will come through Next Gen 911 and be integrated with what you have at PSAP. The only caveat to that is some of your CPE or some of your CAD may not be able to support that. So I will bring a standards-based delivery as far down that process as I can, right? So yes, that's exactly the idea. And where we find barriers, what we've done is we know that in order to interface with the CPE at every PSAP, not all of you can support Nina i3, we know that. So that's one of the requirements on our prime vendor, Autos, is develop a PSAP in interface device that will be able to interface with all the CPE we have in California, transition it over to CAMA, and then support all the, the flow of information that we need to validate the call arrived, the location is there, and it's been anchored and answered and all that. And then when you transfer that call, to package it all back up into a SIP packet that Next Gen 911 can route to the right Peace app again. So yes, all that's being designed into this solution. Yeah. Other, there was one other question I thought. We'll put the link on our website, probably easiest to find, and we'll put it right on our splash page. So it's caloes.ca.gov slash 911. We'll get you right to our website, and we'll put it right there. Okay, so Pat, you want to? Yeah, um, I want to just uh, take take a quick minute, uh, minute and ask you to extend uh, to your police chiefs, your fire chiefs, your city council, your city managers, you know, uh, our gratitude for supporting us in our effort to 
uh, to get nine, uh, Senate Bill 996 and passed, which uh, redid the Senate Fund. I think you can see from the effort that uh, the 911 branch is, is going to, uh, is, is really phenomenal. It's going to really bring California into the next generation of, for the 911 services. It ain't free, folks. Uh, the the Sentinel Fund, as it was existing under the legislation that was passed probably back when I was a baby, uh, which was before 911. <laughs> we did have telephones. Uh, was was you know the, the the revenue stream was was going down down and down and we last year we tried to get legislation passed which modernized the uh, the revenue stream and it, and it fell one vote short. Uh, this year, with the support of you know the cities, the counties, the police chiefs, the fire chiefs, uh, the fire chiefs association, the sheriffs association, chiefs of police, hell, you can name them all. Uh, they really, really did a great job in pushing and getting the legislation passed, which models the the revenue stream based on any device that can contact 911, as opposed to the landlines that the old system was based on. So, had it not been for the passage of that legislation. This would not be happening. They were ready to go a year ago. 911 branch was ready to go a year ago, and they had to put everything into in, in back onto the shelf. This year it's a lot different, and I think you can see we've got some pretty exciting stuff coming up. So thank you all for your support. Thank you for your interest in, in next gen 911, and thank you for the support of the 911 branch. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time.